everybody. Scott Tetweller here, back with another Tuesday live stream. And today we're going to uh, spend a little bit more time in Capture One than we normally do. Uh, a lot of people have been asking questions in the comments on previous videos, and those obviously help drive uh, what we're going to cover during these videos. Uh, so today we're going to spend a little bit more time here than we do uh, normally. Because uh, we do a bunch of sorting here, and then we go into Photoshop and do some fancy stuff. Uh, we're going to be a little bit more uh, Capture One for a little while today, at least. Uh, so I had a wonderful shoot over the weekend. I have another one coming up this next weekend. Uh, and I wanted to kind of uh, go through a few of the images here, but kind of in the st standpoint of what I do workflow wise. Uh, so I've covered this a few times, but I want to briefly go over the, the, the typical things that I do. And then I want to cover a few other things like applying styles, creating styles and using them for consistency in delivery. So we have a, a, a bunch of shoots here that I, I work through. Um, I have uh, there's a whole big variety of stuff going on here. And then playing with uh, some funky light. Uh, so I, I have a studio that's basically a concrete box. And a lot of people are like, well, you create all these really great images. Uh, how are you doing this? And, the, and the, the secret of it is, is to constrain yourself, give yourself absolutely nothing amazing to play with, and then try and do something wacky with it. So uh, here we are using a beam of light basically being spread uh, from a uh, strobe. I actually use a constant light in this case across the floor uh, and just playing with the model in that beam of light on the carpeting. So just kind of playing around with things to challenge yourself uh, because we don't have a great bunch of, you know, I well, have some pretty cool sets in the studio, but uh, not like super amazing sets. Like I use this this day bed a ton because I love it. I've got different sheet sets for it and so on. Uh, we don't use natural light in the studio. And you can kind of see my configuration here. I've talked about this before. And you see a lot of uh, amber today, uh, but there's an 8200 Godox strobe here uh, from molite.com. That's where I get all my stuff. And uh, then there's a piece of white foam core here to stop the strobe from creating a hot spot. So it's just sitting in the window um, and it's usually slaved because this is normally not a, a Godox. This is an Einstein. I've got like six or seven of these things around the studio. Uh, so this is causing this to slave and it just lights up the whole window, which is covered with white uh, foam uh, because we don't uh, we're in an industrial park here and I don't you know care to have prying eyes through the windows. So this kind of creates this light. Now, the reason that this light is next to this one is something that people often kind of like, well, why would you do this? It makes the room feel more natural and the window feel bigger. Because if you look at some of these scenes, you may think, wow, that, that looks just like natural light. And it, it's that, that light next to that that makes this feel more open and airy. And that's one of the secrets, I think, to using uh, a strobe like that in a window is to have it look more natural. Anyway, we're not going to belabor these. There's a whole bunch of stuff here we did. Anyway, I did some of this. And what, so basically what I did is I went through and I cull. I didn't really do a formal culling yet, but I would go through and kind of pick my favorite. So when I do that, then uh, there's normally a button up here called Move to Selects. And I have bound mine to the P key, uh, just like in Lightroom, because I came from Lightroom. And so when I hit P, what it's going to physically do is it's going to pick it up and it's gonna move it into this selects folder. This is a physically different folder. And you can see it gives you the, the address there. It shows you it's actually in my C drive and it's not the same thing as, as Lightroom where it's kind of like a token, like you've flagged it magically. It somehow knows that this is flagged and, and it's in the metadata. It actually moves the file. And when I was a Lightroom user and I moved to Capture One, that frustrated me. I was like, I don't want it in a separate folder. I want them all in the same folder. A little did I realize this is one of the best things about Capture One because when this is all said and done, everything in the Capture folder is stuff that was, it was okay, but it was not as good as everything in the Selects folder. So why, why am I carrying this folder around for the next 20 years? I can just delete it. Everything that's in it after a few months and I've delivered everything that was in the Selects or in this, in this session that I really love, just delete everything else. I mean, there's no reason to haul that around forever. So it's kind of like... Um, I call it discard eligible. They're, they were not, you know, worthy of deleting immediately because they were in focus or whatever. But I found a couple of poses I really liked and then the rest of them are similar or, you know, I just I just moved past them. And this is one of the best things about Capture One. And it's one of the reasons I could never leave this product because everybody else out there who's making a digital asset manager doesn't understand the power of this this thing. Now, if you're a Capture One user and using catalogs, you are completely missing this entire thing. And this is, I think, the number one selling thing for Capture One. I mean, aside from being an amazing raw processor, the ability to sort it in folders like this is just amazing. Now, the other thing that I do is I add 
uh, a job identifier. This is a metadata thing and I add it for each person. So as I'm working with models or whatever, uh, the reason I do this is all of my, my uh, recipes here all use, like if I do social media here and I look at client, you'll see that under the file subfolder, it uses the job identifier to create a folder in my Dropbox. So if I click on social media, it will create the folder in Dropbox, or in this case, a folder that already exists, and then drop the shared image in there when we're all done. Uh, so even though I'm delivering four different ladies here, or three different ladies, if I click on all of these and process them all, it'll drop them all in the correct folder. And I don't have to just do one person, change the target, do one person, change the target. It's so nice to just be able to fire and forget basically on all these different uh, recipes. So. That's one of the main things that I love about Capture One. Now, another thing uh, someone had mentioned just in a comment a couple, couple minutes ago, I noticed, is that under view here, there is the browser. Now, I've, it, I think my control B, I think is the default here. Um, and then there's the viewer. So there's a difference between the two. So the viewer, which I've made mine the tilde key right below the escape key, because that's I know, it's my kind of my knee jerk reaction when I want to get out of something, I hit that. So you've got two different modes. Now, if you're if you're clicking on an image and you hit tilde, it's going to make that image full screen because you're viewing it. And when you're in the browser, you're viewing these and you can change the size of the thumbnails up here. But if you select multiple images, hit tilde, now you're viewing multiple images and you get into a situation where you can use your mouse wheel to, to scroll. If you hold down your shift key, it'll scroll all of them equally. That's if you're doing a comparison. Let's say we're looking at these two images here. Uh, then you would hold down your shift key and you can move them simultaneously. So there's a little bit of nuance in how this is working. A lot of people are like, well, I, I don't understand how the viewer and the browser are different. If you're selecting more than one image, yes, they work very similarly. I use this for culling too, because if you hold down your control key and click on these, uh, you can well, you can remove them from the selection, but it's easier to just do it from here and say, I want to look at these three and then hit tilde or go to view. And I think the default is V by the way for view. Uh, but again, it's just my knee-jerk reaction to go for that tilde key. So from here, then I can go ahead and, and figure out which one of these three I like the best and and then move from, move forward from there. So that's one of the things that's different between the viewer and a browser. And I think that that's kind of confused people a bit. Now, if you're a, a Lightroom user and you like to see the um, the browser on the bottom or whatever, you can dock the browser as well. Um, I don't tend to do that, but uh, you can if you'd like. Uh, there's options for that un under here for where you want the browser to be. Uh, so in this case, you could put it at the bottom and then you can use the film strip mode like this and you've got your very similar look to, to Lightroom um, or you can also move it over to the side. So there's lots of um, ways to do this. You can change all kinds of crazy stuff about the browser and this. And then if you want to place it on the right, I know some people really prefer this. Uh, but in my mind, I don't I don't really need to see these and the view at the same time. Um, I tend to just kind of look at one or deal with it and then go back to the browser by just hitting that tilde key. So that's my just my kind of method for doing it. So that's uh, that's a little bit about the browser and the viewer. Someone had a question on that and uh, I thought I would cover it briefly. So let's talk about styles a bit. I'm going to work with these three images today. Uh, so. The first thing I typically do workflow wise is I'm going to crop them. That's my, my first thing. So I just go to my crop tool and I'm going to leave this as two by threes um, because I like that crop for these, these longer images. So I just want to get rid of a bit of the bottom here, which isn't really doing anything for the image, but I do want to show off her great back and then come to this one. This has got the opposite problem. I really don't want to see the hand. I'm more worried about the nape of the neck here, this area. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of crop it up like this. And then this one here is kind of the same situation. Uh, I'm not worried so much about the hand as I am about the breasticles here and the, uh, the face. So I've got my three images done now. I've, I've cropped them. I'm happy with them. And then I want to kind of size them and do something with them to be interesting or creative. Again, I'm using my tilde key to move between the browser and the viewer. Um, again, I normally turn my, view, my browser off. That's control shift B. Uh, we'll move on. I guess it moves it to the bottom or the top. Shows you how often I use the thing. Just go here and control B, I guess, turn that off. Uh, so now I've got my, my three images. Now I can kind of play with what I want them to be. And that's where I want to kind of talk about styles and adjustments today. Uh, so we, we have these custom styles and the built-in styles. The built-in styles are the ones that come with Capture One. And depending on what package you bought, you've got all these different options and you can play with them. And as you 
As you mouse over them, it's going to apply them to the image so you can kind of check them out and see what you like. And there's some, some nice ones in there. There are some color effects ones. You know, there's, there's just a bunch of them. Now, Capture One does not use LUTs, unfortunately, which is something that I keep asking about because I think if that's really kind of short-sighted of them. I mean, so many other packages use LUTs. Um, I've even made a joke with the developer saying that I, I what's the under over on Microsoft Paint getting LUTs bef LUT support before Capture One does. Uh, so there's it's just ridiculous that this product doesn't support that in my mind. But anyway, then there's uh, these, some of these are the other things. And I, I don't use, I in truth, I don't use any of these things. Uh, the black and white ones I find intriguing, uh, but that's about it. And now they do have uh, a couple other ones. They have these spring ones, which they came out with not too long ago. I think these are actually part of the standard one now. Then there's custom. Now let's talk about the difference between styles and a preset. And that's another thing that, that jumps on people. So if we're in a curve, for example, and I have a preset up here named no true black, and you've probably seen me use this before. All it does is lift this point this way. That's all it does. It's that ridiculous little nudge there. And by the way, let's just work with one picture here. Let's work with just one. Uh, so all it does is move this up. That is a preset for this tool and only this tool so it's a preset, no true black, and that's it. And when I save that preset, it also makes that preset available here under custom presets. And you can see under curve, there's no true black and solar, which is another thing you guys have probably talked me, uh, heard me cover before. So it's really interesting is you can apply the presets to curves and other tools inside of Capture One without actually finding the tool. Uh, so I can go and I can say, well, I know this is a, an adjustment for for the color balance tool called Amber. Uh, there's um, metadata presets. This is the metadata preset I load when I when I load everything in from a photo shoot. Um, I load this, which contains all my copyright information. So it's a it's a preset, uh, just like it would everything else. And then a white balancer is like this. I don't know what this is. I call it Fave. I have no idea where that came from. But any of your presets for no matter what tool it is always exists in here. So you can actually get to it pretty easily without having to wander around and find the same tools you use repeatedly. So a preset is one tool only. A style is multiple tools. So they, and they don't have to be presets obviously to be in a style, um, but if you're kind of doing the Lego thing and you've got each tool has a preset, a style could be a collection of presets. You can kind of think of it like that. Now the style brushes do the same kind of thing, but again, they're applying specifically to a layer which they name, and then you have certain operations or settings that you do repeatedly. Uh, now, I'm not really gonna do any of those on this image yet, but uh, I can show you one that I made here. It's just called hair. I just click on hair, and then I would make my brush a certain size. And you'll notice when I start to paint, it creates a new layer called hair details, and then I can just color in the hair, and that's the hair details layer. So it labels it, which is really nice because although we always say, hey, always name your labels or name your layers, no one ever does. Uh, so this is nice for that that reason. And then the settings are almost always the same for this. So it's kind of nice. But what I want to do is uh, I want to take and take one of these styles here and I want to I want to make a style for this because I don't really have a good black and white style. And that's what I want these in. So I'm going to go and we're going to go to our color tab here and we're going to enable black and white. And now black and white, whenever you enable black and white in Capture One, it must be on the background layer. It doesn't work on any other layer. And I really don't understand what that limitation is about or why it's there, but it's just a fact of life. Now we can then go ahead and, and split tone this using these tools if we wanted to, but I prefer to just kind of continue using this thing. And you can go ahead and, and create another layer if you'd like, just click and hold and create another filled adjustment layer. And now we can continue to work on this you know, and adding, say, a split tone this way. These sliders, I think, are really not not easy to use, or at least not as easy as this thing. This thing is just amazing. And you see now, because Lightroom has taken the idea, and hey, that's a great idea. We'll just invent that. Uh, but I really love it. So I'll say go shadow here, mid-tone, maybe a little bit of warmth here, and highlight maybe a little bit of warmth there. Something like that. Something interesting. And then, of course, on my shadow, I can do the same thing I did with a curve. Uh, which is where I lifted that uh, that that bottom part there, kind of like this. I can lift that up, or I can also do it here on the shadow. I can just lift this up, which is kind of the same thing. So something like this, and now it's created kind of this nice, kind of hazy, sleepy kind of look that that I like. 
Uh, now, are there any other adjustments I want to make? Uh, maybe I want to recover some of the highlight on this specific image, and we'll talk about why I say this specific image. So I want to pull just a little bit. I don't care about the window. I care about our shoulder blade. Uh, so I'm not really looking at the window. And you can click your exposure warning here if you want to see that. But the window is not the subject of the uh, the photo. So I don't care that the window is blown out. I care that her, her skin is perfect. Uh, so don't get freaked out if you're trying to like bring every highlight back in a specific image. It is not important unless it's the scene, you know, unless it's the, it's the specific part of the scene you're trying to show off, then I would go ahead and focus on it. But otherwise, don't don't belabor retouching parts of the image that really don't matter. I know a lot of people get hung up on skies, like they're, well, the sky is kind of blown out. What well, is the sky important? Is the sky have great clouds? Does the sky have drama? Uh, do you want the sky to have drama? Well, then you're going to have to go replace it. But to just to recover the sky at the expense of the subject is not a good plan. And so just be aware of why you're bringing highlights back. And if it's important, uh, the highlights on the skin here are what will matter. Now, maybe a little bit of contrast. Or what I'm finding I'm doing more recently is I'm actually pulling contrast this way. I just kind of like that, that look. Uh, and I have some both work in this case. But let's just go this way. In brightness, we could bring brightness down a little bit if we wanted to. Um, or what I was thinking I might do is just kind of bring the blacks down. This is fighting with, you'd think it'd be fighting with what we did with the curve here where we lifted this, although we did it over on that color tab, but it works the same way. But if you bring your blacks all the way down, the blackest black is still not a pure black because of this little lift right here. This, this brought that up just enough to make it not a pure black. So this now in itself is its own kind of interesting look. So I could bring the darks down substantially like this. And I know that there's still detail even in the darkest darks. And I really like this. I think, wow, this is great. I want to go ahead and make this a preset. So I can go over to my adjustments here and you can save it as a style. So uh, you don't have to save things as styles. You know, you can do whatever you want to do with things. Uh, but I say, I want to make this as a style. So save settings as style. Now, if I'm saving this as a style, the one thing that is kind of critical is that not everyone is going to be in a situation where they have a shoulder blade that was a little bit bright. And then when you think, well, uh, I'm just going to save this style and everything will be fine. But in truth, you don't want to make this highlight recovery part of your style. So we would uncheck that, meaning we're going to apply this style to a lot of other images. And I don't know that there are parts that are blown out. So doing this or adjustments to exposure or brightness in a lot of situations are things you really shouldn't mess with because let's well, say a person does exposure correct first and then they apply a style because they like your color toning and the way you've you've balanced the image but you undid all of their exposure when they had it all set that's frustrating so i'm going to leave the contrast and i'm going to leave the black uh, black recoveries that not really the recovery but we just darkened our blacks a bit um, but we did leave our contrast curve here and we did our color balance here. If there's any other settings that we want to do, then we would go ahead and save those. Now, I, I did these on another adjustment layer here. So if I want to save it as a style, they all have to be on the same layer. Otherwise, it's going to create this, this kind of train wreck. And so in my mind, I would go back and just make these changes real, real quick right here. So, so we have a little bit of a shadow here, blue shadow, lift it a bit. We went to contrast, we increased the contrast a bit. We did a high, little bit of highlight recovery here and we decreased our blacks. So this style now is a, a nice look, although I did do some mid-tone here, a little bit of mid-tone. This blue and teal or blue and peach kind of look is pretty popular and I like it, uh, but sometimes it's a little too much. So I wanna be a very delicate with it and maybe with the highlight as well. This one, again, you can do stupid stuff with so be careful not to wreck your own pictures. I see so often people over post produce their picture. Like they, uh, we, in photography competitions, we call it crunchiness. Like their image will be so contrasty and have so much clarity on it. Uh, the, the person is not doing themselves any favors by, by you know, just cranking these things up to the point where there's a halo around the subject because it's so crispy. Don't overproduce your picture. If you lit it properly, then now you're doing the nuanced changes. And that's really kind of the, the direction you're going here. We're not doing the Instagram big heavy overhaul in images. We're trying to take our time 
and just give it a finishing touch and give it a feel. The majority of the feel the image has is already done by the time we're getting into Capture One, right? You've lit it a certain way, you've posed her a certain way, you put it in a certain set. Now you're nuancing that. Uh, so your, your changes to these things should be delicate. So if I go back here to my styles now and you can see that it's using two presets. It's using my metadata preset and it's using the no true black on the curve preset. Uh, and this allowed to stack them. There's there's some options in here as what do you want to stack them or replace them. That's pretty cool about uh, Capture One is you can stack presets and you, know, you can't really do that in Lightroom. You get one preset and you get one preset. Here you can pick a bunch of them, have them fight <laughs> and see who wins. And if you do have things that overwrite different ones, it will actually tell you that when you hover over it, it would tell you, like it says, use active curve here, curve, red curve, green curve, blue curve, and luma curve. If I had another preset that I applied or another style, and it would override when it would show you overridden and it would uh, talk about that. I'm not going to go into that too much today, but you get the idea. So once I get this style the way that I want it, I go here and I can say save custom style. And again, what is it that I want to include in the style? I do not want to include highlight recovery because that is specific to this one image. And I don't really want everyone else in the world to have to suffer through whatever it is that I changed on here because again, they made those decisions. I also don't want to, to force them to use this crop. So, hey, Louie. So I would remove the composition crop mandate here because I'm not gonna make them recrop their image at two by three uh, as part of this style. I could, but that, that'd be, I imagine, frustrating. And then do we want to use clarity? No, I was showing that as a demonstration here and I really don't, I thought I cleared it. So I wanna make sure that I turn that thing off. I'm gonna hit save and I'm gonna call it something. Now, inside of Capture One, you can you can organize things into folders. I have the Nordic lifestyle set that Capture One released and then I have my own styles here. And I have an Amber, uh, Claire, Emma. Some of these, by the way, I've given away as the monthly rewards for members or people who join the channel and help support it. Uh, so you got a couple of those coming this month. I did not get the ones out last month. Uh, so I'm gonna be releasing here two back to back. And I'm probably going to throw a bonus one out there too because I got so caught up in stuff and I never got got um, them out. Uh, so I want to make sure that everybody gets that reward. Uh, so I'm going to call this one. Uh, I want to put a black and white in front of it. So black and white. Uh, and I'm going to call this amber. Black and white amber. Actually, no. Um, let's call it because it's similar to the other style. Uh, uh, I don't know what I'm going to call it. Let's call it black and white suit. So I'm giving them girls names because it's fun and it's easy to remember. It's kind of like uh, the CrossFit, all their, all their workouts are named after girls. So I'm just gonna stick with that. So black and white suit. So now I'm done here. I can go back to uh, these images here, like these two that I liked. And I can go down here to black and white styles or to my Deltliner styles here and find black and white suit and just click over it. And now these all look as if they're singing from the same hymnal. They all have the same look and color tone, and I don't have to worry about things like highlight recovery missing, missing them up. So let's say this one here, does it need highlight recovery? I can go and I can make those decisions for this specific image. So maybe a little bit here, and not enough that it flattens the life out of the image. Like I don't need this distracting element here. So I don't wanna bring all that back, but I do like some of the hairs here in front of her face. Um, if this is a problem, by the way, like this I think is a problem. Like I don't like this, this box here. What I would do is just create a new, uh, a new layer, kind of highlight in through here where I know I've got some recovery to do, and I could actually make this pretty big. Let's make it big like this, just because otherwise you're going to end up with a weird mark. Uh, trust me, just kind of make bigger, broader strokes. You're a lot safer, and then I can bring the hair back here. Now the mask is only affecting that area. Now, if I want to, I can make another one here and say, well, you know what, this this is bothering me a lot. So I'm just going to go ahead and make a mask that looks like this. And then I can go here and raise the exposure of this area. So now I've got the best of both worlds. I have recovery of the parts of the hair that I, I care about. And then I have, I'm blowing out the parts up here that I find distracting. Uh, without having to go into Photoshop, that's a pretty nice recovery. Now here I find the vertical is actually kind of pleasing. And again, we have a little bit of recovery to do on her back. So I can go to this image and say, well, let's recover a little bit of highlight and see how that looks. And I think that's good, but I don't like this edge here. So again, create a new level, 
layer, sorry, beave or brush, and just kind of draw in this area. Again, big, broad, non-specific strokes make life a little bit easier. And then I can raise this here until I'm happy with it. I kind of like the way that curtain looks that way. So, and then here's our last one. And I think we kind of already kind of did this one here and I don't mind the shear this way. So I'm really happy with all three of those images and I really didn't have to do anything uh, outside of creating a custom style, which I can use again and again. So I have other parts of her session like this one, for example, maybe I want to try that one. Now this is a completely different outfit and a completely different scene. And I might say, well, do I want to try that? Um, I could do that. And the other way to do it is to say, I'm just going to take the settings from this and you click this copy button up here and go to the images or images. You can shift click and select more than one and then go apply and it will apply whatever changes are those on this layer and all the other layers to it. So if I look in these now, they all contain those layers. Well, this one isn't real handy, right? I have all this, this weird layers here from the shear uh, that was up there and then the, the other mark on her, uh, on her chest there. So this, like this preset kind of works here, but it doesn't. It's again, same situation here. It's creating all these weird things from the curtain. So be aware that when you're trying to use these apply and copy, they are going to use all of the layers. I'm hitting undo by the way, a bunch of times. So I, I prefer to do these as a style. It's just, you know, if I'm going to do something like this, I can go down here and say, I'm just going to apply black and white suit to these. And now we're good and we don't have to deal with any of those weird layers because again, each one has its own recovery problem. Maybe like this one here. I, I don't have any sort of highlight here that needs to be recovered. So I'm not going to mess with it. Like this is just fine the way that it is. And this is a completely different image with a completely different woman. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to that one, but this one would be a shame to do in black and white anyway. Uh, so I can just go ahead and reset this image and then we'll return to normal and we're good to go. So same thing down here. If I want to do the same, the same operation here, I would just go and select that preset. So it's kind of nice to be able to pick and choose what you want. Now there's another, another aspect of this, and that is the clipboard. So we talked about when we, when we created our custom preset a minute ago, our style, it, it said, these are all the things that have been modified with that image. So let's go back to this image here. And um, I wanted to copy this up. Now, when I go and I look at the, um, save custom style, you see all the check boxes for the things that have been altered on this specific image. Now, if I don't want to go ahead and create a style just to be able to use this information on another, on another image, that's what the, uh, the clipboards are for. So there's different clipboards on ways you can apply things. Uh, and that's again, one of the powerful things about capture one. Uh, but the, the goal here is to talk about kind of styles and the way these things work. So I really like, the ability to to quickly go through and add these updates to images without having to go back and and uh, mess with each one individually and create custom styles is one of the things I love about it. Now I'm not a huge style preset guy because each image is its own. Like if I I went through these before and I was looking at my my previous ones. Now so by the way these are stacking now. So we talked about uh, this. So it shows you that no true black has been overridden because Emma, the preset here uses the curve and it overrides that. And you can stack these all day long, which is kind of cool. So now I've created a new one. It's Sue combined with Emma. Well, let's say I don't want that one. So I can combine it with, um, hmm. yeah, you get the idea. You just combine them. You can start stacking them to create a new one. Once you're done, then you can go ahead and save that as a preset. So it's just kind of fun. Um, it's one of those things that I guess are not supporting lots. At least they're doing something cool that way, right? Uh, so we go here and again, hover over these and try different ideas and see what you like. I think this one would be interesting as black and white, uh, but I think it has more of an old world kind of feel to it. So I kind of want to go with something a little more, uh, I don't know, like something like this, but much more desaturated perhaps. So I don't want to come up with a preset for something and say, or I'm going to take my images and say they must always conform to a preset because they may not like that. Like this, I want to raise this black point up and bring the middle back. So it's kind of a vintagey feel to it without having to do anything. And then again, if I want to save this preset, say, you know, I might want to use this again, again, and again, and again. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, 
I'm one of those people that each image kind of has what it wants to be. I think it was, uh, I forget which sculptor it was, uh, who's, I think it might've been actually Michelangelo. who's like, you, you, you take your chisel and you kind of explore the rock and the rock will tell you what it wants to be. You know, you're, you're exploring the rock and it's going to tell you what's, what's going on. I kind of feel the same way when, when I'm shooting images is when I'm doing the final post-production and we're playing with the colors and you see me going through this color wheel and playing with the different colors, I'm seeing what does the image want? What does the image think it should be? Uh, so if we take this image, for example, I really like this, but is it the best one? I don't know. I didn't explore anything, did I? I just kind of went right there. So I usually go all the way around here until I find something that's close. And I'm like, well, I really like, kind of like right in here. And then I'll, I'll leave that alone, but then I'll come here and say, what's the, I call it the volume knob. How much of that color do I want to apply? Like, I really like the color. How much do I want to apply? And I can play with this. That way it's a straight line and you're not trying to, to move this without wiggling it back and forth this way. I gotta like this color quite a bit. Now, do I want to do the same thing with the mid-tone? My, my knee-jerk reaction is, is that the mid-tone is the opposite of this. So it should be over here somewhere. Usually. doesn't have to be. If you put it on this side, it's going to desaturate the image, which is fine. Which, in this case, I think I like better. Highlight, again, normally creates kind of a, a look to an image that I don't usually find appealing. Uh, I normally, again, push it all the way up and make sure you're not making the girl too green or she's too red. I gotta find the right skin tone for her. And then once I find it, then use this to make sure that you're applying it in a straight line. Um, so you're getting a nice, even tone with it. And then the master is the kind of the overall. What I want is a feeling. Uh, usually I put this back in the middle or I'll push it toward warm. Just because it's that's what I like. It's my it's it's my picture. Darn it, I want to make it that way. Uh, let's play here. Saturation's down a bit. Uh, do I want any contrast or do I want to make the contrast negative? Ooh, definitely like it negative here. So playing with the contrast slider. Um, it's one of those tools that I, again, I really kind of think the negative side is more interesting to me right now. It's you know just like anything else on any given day. I might completely change my mind, but that's what I like today. Now the blacks here, we have brought those down. Uh, we, this is using that, that kind of that preset we had a second ago. Got to be careful here. We don't want to lose the detail in the fascinator there. By the way, that is called a fascinator and that a hat. If, uh, there's there's actually a completely separate group of people who make those. They're called milliners, and a milliner makes fascinators. Yeah, the things I know. There you go. <laughs> so, there you go. You can press your friends at the bar with that. Uh, so any other whites I want to add? Sometimes pushing the whites up here is interesting, but again, beware of blowing stuff out. I can use this. So uh, this is sometimes an interesting effect. Uh, one of the other ones I like to do too. Uh, for, especially if I'm saving it as a preset, you have to be aware of this. Uh, you can't really do this as a preset. Is to create a new field adjustment layer and use this in Luma range. This is one of my one of my favorites. So what you're basically doing is saying, here's we're going to use a range that goes from the blackest black, creates a nice little ramp up to this color, all the way through, and then kind of ramps back down. I'm going to do it the other way. I'm going to take it and say everything that's white, all the way to about this spot here. And then create a ramp so it kind of fades back down into the middle tone. So something like this. Now this is interesting. So this is creating just a mask for this layer. Okay. And now anything I do to that layer is applying only to those areas that were highlighted by that. And again, I think this is really kind of interesting, especially from the dodging and burning standpoint. Um, because we don't have to go back and try and dodge and burn things. We can kind of do it. We're getting away cheap, basically. Because you can notice the nice highlight on her shin here. Uh, from using this technique. And it's creating a little bit of a hot spot over here, but again, it's just a mask. So if I hit E for eraser, I can erase the mask. Here's what the mask looks like. I can say, yeah, I like that a little bit better. I don't mind a little bit of highlight here on the ribbon. I think that's nice. So this little adjustment layer is really nice, but we saw earlier when you create a preset from things like this, this specific mask is gonna go with it, which is useless. Right? It's not useful on any other image other than this one. Even a very similar image in the same set doesn't have the ribbon in the same place. So just be aware that creating luma ranges like this as part of an adjustment style are not going to stick around. Like they're going to be kind of uh, not something you can use over and over again that way. Uh, so what I tend to do is, is make myself a little hint and I'll name it adjustment layer. 
and give it some settings and then know that I have to go in and just simply adjust the luma range for this specific image to make sure that it works. So that's about the best you can do. And, and realistically, that's enough. Um, I don't think that, that we all depend so much on presets that we can't go ahead and tweak the selection process. One other thing I like to do here is I like to do a little bit of a clarity thing. This again, just me. Again, if I'm gonna save this as a potential preset, do all your work on a background. So then I would go and uh, go here. I keep my clarity tool on this tab. My workflow is from this to this, right? And I don't really use a uh, tethered capture here. I do that at the studio though. I need to do a video on tethered capture. And some people ask me questions about it. And Capture One is amazing at tethered. Uh, but I don't I do not do that at home here, which is where I'm doing most of my uh, post-production. I'm gonna start here and work my way across. And in here, because we're doing all our Photoshop up front here, then we do our color toning and color grading after Photoshop. In here, I would use my clarity tool, but I don't wanna use clarity in the whole thing because this looks terrible. Uh, and by the way, this is like your only option in so many other post-production pieces of software. So why not use the power of layers? So um, if I'm gonna create a background or a, um, a preset, I'm not gonna use clarity as a blanket statement across my image, usually. I mean, sometimes maybe it's interesting, but I, again, prefer to do something that's a little more nuanced that only works on this specific image. So I really like it in the hair. And in fact, uh, we, we were talking about earlier having that hair preset down here. I have a hair details preset. And all that's going to do is create a new adjustment layer called hair details. And it puts a little clarity and a little structure. If we look at, at what it's doing, just hover over there too and go into here. It turns it to punch with clarity of 39 and a structure of, uh, it should have a structure to it, a little bit of a structure. What that's doing is really bringing out the, the details in the fascinator. So that's the only thing it's really doing. And I don't want to draw, you know, I don't want to go all over the place with this, like this, this, um, Canon, like that'd be, that's too much. But sometimes I'll do that. If I'm being lazy, I'll just say, you know, hey, I already have a hair details layer. What if I can just use some of that on, on some of this, this uh, brocade here, or whatever that's called. Is that brocade? I want to throw that term out there. Let's say it's brocade. And make sure none of this highlight is blown out here. That looks nice. So our before and after, hit the Y key. So that's what we did in Capture One. It's a beautiful image to start with, but I think it wanted to be a little more retro. So I did that just by, again, playing with all these different things and trying to keep them on layers. But again, hard to make this into a preset. So stuff that you know you're gonna be using later, um, you can go ahead and, and kind of like earmark it, but realistically do all of your preset work on a background layer. It just makes life a lot easier, especially if you're dealing with this. Um, once you turn to black and white, you're kind of, you're, you're dedicated to using the background layer if you plan to use it as a preset. I don't know why it's like that. It's just one of the limitations of Capture One. All right, so uh, that's kind of that. I want to play with one of these as well. So by the way, if you like the stream and you haven't clicked the like button, I would greatly appreciate if you do that. That's your way of showing appreciation for what you're watching and that you like it. Uh, and it gives me a gauge to know what kind of topics you want me to cover on this channel. Uh, so I don't know that I want to do this as a black and white. It wasn't my original intention to do so. Um, but I do want to hide a lot of that, um, a lot of the carpet. Like I don't need to show off the carpet there. So yeah, I think this is going to be one of those where I'm going to have to make a preset just for it. Or at least color, color grade it the way I want to. So if I don't go into Photoshop, which ultimately I'm probably going to for this series of images, I really like them. Um, I use my trick here to make sure that I've got her skin appropriately metered, so about on this line, because she's Caucasian, that's about where I want it. That looks good. So I did have to increase this a bit with the curve. You could also do this with the exposure. That'll work as well, a little bit less. And then I can, I can play with the blacks if I want. I don't want more black. I don't need to light the room. I always want the stripe. This It's not supposed to be like this. It's supposed to be like this. There's something interesting. Now, normally I would not use any sort of a contrast adjustment before I go to capture or before I go to Photoshop because these are, again, subject to change. But once the pixels are rendered in Photoshop, you can't change them. You're really kind of pushing pixels around rather than dealing with the raw data. And that's the power of Capture One. And a lot of people are like, well, I really like, you know, I can't I can't go to Sony because I really like the colors, the color tones on my 
my Canon, and when I went to Sony and I tried it, um, they looked all weird. Well, it's because you're using Lightroom. It, Lightroom has a, a subpar raw render, raw rendering engine. Capture One's just so much better. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Uh, now I don't have a white card, so I'm just going to white balance on our tooth and see how that looks. And there we go. Uh, so when in doubt, the tooth, the sclera of the eye, will at least get you close. Um, I'm not so much a stickler on white balance because I care about her skin tone at the end of the day. Uh, so if I go here, let's color balance this thing. Shadow, again, just kind of wiggle it around and see what I like. It's kind of playing with the whole gamut of colors here. I think I like it right in here. Mid-tone, same thing. i got to bring some color back into her body here. I don't want her to look all weird. So I'm going to turn it all the way up so I'm sure I got the right color tone here. Something like this. I can turn it down until it makes it look good. Highlight. Do I want something in here to highlight? No, that's affecting her teeth more than anything else. Let's just get rid of that. And then the master is, again, for the whole image, just kind of add a little more cohesion to the whole thing. There we go. So I really like that look. Uh, go back here. and see, Do I want to lift this black for this one? Hmm. No, I don't, I don't know that I do. I think that's kind of revealing too much of what's going on in the rest of the scene. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with no. Um, but maybe I pull the mid down. Let's put a little S in here. Does that look interesting? Possibly. Possibly. Let's try one other thing. That's kind of the same as adding contrast. By the way, this S curve and contrast are more or less the same thing. Uh, so if I reset this and pull this down and add a little bit of S curve to this, it's almost the exact same look. You just got to be careful not to make it too aggressive. You know, a lot of people put these big S curves in here and they're like, that just looks terrible. Don't, it shouldn't look like you forced it uh, in post. It should be like you just nuanced it. And then there's a difference between correcting for uh, for problems and correcting for, for mood and tone and style. And don't confuse the two. You know, if you're correcting for one, don't feel the need to, to push it aggressively. Now, I'm thinking about cropping this ankle off over here because it's a bright spot and it has no context. So if I do something like this, I think this will be a better picture. Yeah, it just it was it made no sense. So just kind of looking over the entire set, what am I looking at? I just want to see this stripe, but I don't want that bright ankle over there. So I think that looks pretty nice. And I could maybe play with some of these other things like, do I want a little bit more highlight here? So not just using it to recover, because I think that looks terrible. It's just, it took so much of the life out of the image. Can I push it up? Can I can I take it the other direction? Maybe, I like that. Do we want a little more shadow recovery so we're telling the story there? Maybe. So don't make these two fight. Although you can do some pretty interesting things with it. There are some really weird looks you can get when you're pushing one down. And then recovering the black with this one like that is just really weird. I bet you can do the same thing this direction. So you recover your shadows, but you pull your blacks down. This is the same fight, by the way. If you're looking for fights, <laughs> you can do this with, with exposure and, and brightness as well. So you can pu pull it up with exposure and then try and lower it with brightness. It will look much different than if you lower if you increase the brightness and lower the exposure. So there's all these little tiny games you can play with these pushing and pulling aspects of uh, Capture One and Lightroom for that matter. I mean, both these work, but it creates these really dynamic looks to it. Now, is this style going to be useful anywhere else other than a, a, a scene lit by a single strip? I'm going to probably go with no. It's not going to be a really common situation. Uh, so probably not something I'm going to save as a preset. But if I have more than one set or more than one image like I do here, copy it up go here and apply it now there's another way uh, to do this as well um, let's talk about that briefly because that's kind of cool that's what this little goofy arrow thing is here and there's a lot of little icons in capture one that are not evident uh, on first on first glance so if I if I select two and you notice one is a bigger box around it that's our primary and then all of your other ones are secondary so we have a whole bunch of images and this is our primary this is the one that we're talking about when we're referring to settings so if we say click here, and I just did a shift key, by the way. So clicked and then shift click here. You go and you click on this double, little double arrow thing. It's going to bring up this adjustment clipboard and say, what is it that you wanted to, to do here? Were you wanting to do exposure, exposure, contrast, brightness, and saturation? Because I'm finding 
things here that were adjusted. Why saturation is highlighted, I'm not really sure. Mostly because it's probably just this, oh yeah, duh. It's this exposure control is why I clicked on the double arrows. So say, yeah, I want to do all three of these and click apply. And that's going to take all three of those and move them over here. I can do the same thing with this one. I can say, well, I want to do highlight recovery here and click apply. Now that's kind of a pain in the ass. If I'm going to bring that up and then click OK automatically, you can hold down shift and it will apply it immediately. So you just hold down shift and now it, ding, it copied them across. In fact, let's demonstrate that. Let's do this. You hold down shift and click the double arrow. It's going to go ahead and apply all the way across all of them. So a really quick way to apply uh, one settings across multiple images. Um, you can also do that again up here with copy and apply. But if you're doing it by individual things like, hmm, I'll get done with the color balance here. Like I really like this color balance and I want to apply it to other ones. Just shift click on this icon here. And it says right there, hold alt to suppress the dialog box or hold shift to apply immediately. Just hold shift. And it should take a second and then we've got it all good. And that looks a little bit different, doesn't it? So there's um, obviously some changes that we made here uh, that were not in the color balance tool. Uh, so again, I've got to go back and either collect all those individual ones, or again, just use your handy apply button here, and you're good to go. So let's make sure we get that copy here and apply here. So there you go. That, might, that looks like they're they're together now. I don't want to have a, a book of images where they're all slightly different. That that's, just, that's very unprofessional looking. So I want to try and keep uh, maintain a nice look across all the images, at least the ones that are from the same set, like this one here. Although it looks really nice in black and white, I might decide to keep that one. This in black and white would be a shame. Um, anyway, so I wanted to kind of cover some some more in-depth Capture One stuff this morning on styles and presets and, and so on. So I thought that would be a nice uh, nice uh, Tuesday stream. Yeah, today is Tuesday. A uh, Tuesday stream to kind of cover that. Uh, so if you have any questions or comments, uh, as of this again, this stream was, was brought to you by the fact that someone had brought up in a comment on a previous video about the viewer and the browser. And I want to kind of delve into a little bit more of that and the work that can be done in here. Uh, so if you have any questions or comments, if you like the stream, please take a moment and click the like button. And everybody take care.